Hello and welcome to the World Education Summit. Today I'm so very proud to be here with you today. I know there's so many great speakers and I'm just very honored that you are going to be here with me today. So today I am talking about something that I really feel is going to be a game changer in the classroom. So much so, I have to say, that I can equate it with how it was centuries ago when teachers found out how important behavior management was. That was a game changer for classroom classroom behavior. And the same thing is going to happen, in my opinion, with emotional intelligence. When a child has emotional intelligence, it is going to stack on to the education and the behavior management, and it is going to make teachers' lives better and kids' lives great. Now, before I get too much into what I would like to talk about, which is emotional intelligence, I want to tell you a quick story. And this is the kind of the pinnacle of what emotional intelligence can do for our children. And with repetition and practice, this is something that can happen wholeheartedly. One of the things that I love to tell you is a story about a little girl who was just back from a party and she had her best dress on and she really, really wanted to go swimming. She was hot and she was ready just to kind of de-stress. And her parents said, sure, no problem. You can jump in the pool. Well, the thing is, is that she didn't want to put on her bathing suit. She wanted to jump in the pool right away. And when the parents said no, she had a complete meltdown. And the parents were just beside themselves. They didn't know what to do. And so they, they rationalized with the little girl and they did their very best. And finally, they just had to take a break and they went into the kitchen and the little girl was still in the hallway, just bawling her eyes out. And while they were talking about, the parents realized that it's been a little while and the little girl had stopped crying. And they thought, oh no, you know how it is with kids. If, if they're quiet, a lot of times there could be a problem. So they went into the hallway and just as they were walking in, the little girl were, was walking down the steps with their bathing suit on. And the parents were flabbergasted. They couldn't believe that she had done this on her own, let alone go up upstairs and get her own bathing suit on. And the, the parents asked the, the little one, you had such a meltdown, you had such a problem. Why all of a sudden do you have your bathing suit on? And the little girl said, well, mommy and daddy, I learned at school that we have two parts of our brain. We have the barking dog part of our brain and my barking dog part of the brain was really, really barking. I really didn't want to put my bathing suit on. But I learned as well is that if I calm myself down, I call in my wise owl part of my brain. And this is where I really start to think. And I realized I didn't want to ruin my dress. I didn't want to ruin all these different things. And so I just went ahead and put on my bathing suit and I just want to go swimming. Can I go swimming, Mom and Dad? And it's easy as that. Guys, this is something that doesn't happen overnight. This is something with constant repetition and practice and training in emotional intelligence skills and letting our children understand what it is about their brain and how to control themselves and, and regulate their own emotion and understand their own self-awareness, and so many of these different things that happen when you understand emotional intelligence. Now, before I get any, any farther, I would really like to talk about my why. Everything ends and begins with a why, and my why is kids, parents, and teachers. I really true believe, I really believe that the number one people on this planet are kids, parents, and teachers. And when this group of people gets taken care of and is given the information that they need to our society and helping everybody across the world. And the thing is, is that the number one people in a child's life is a parent. Their parent is the first teachers. And it is something that really is an integral part of making sure that a child does their very best and the parents have the information that they need to really make a big difference in their child's life. It is such an important part of a child's life for someone to model correct behaviors and correct thinking and problem solving. And the parents can be the very first people to do that, as well as teachers. The teachers spend the most time with the children throughout the week, and it's so important that these amazing people also get what they need to make sure that they can help their kids as best as possible and their students. Now, 
Who am I? I am an award-winning educator. I really have dedicated my life to the number one people in, in my world, which is kids, parents, and teachers. I've taught third grade for years. I am now a physical education teacher. And I have, two, I have an amazing family. My wife is a VE teacher, a varying exceptionalities teacher. So we have teaching in the family. Both my parents are teachers. And so we really have a generational want to help kids, parents, and teachers. And I have two amazing daughters and it really is a blessing to be able to, to go through this journey with them. Now, emotional intelligence has always been something that's very important, but it really has come right to the top with COVID. So many times we have seen children that have been a part of the isolation and the shutdown has not given the proper socialization because of isolation. And unfortunately, they really haven't had an opportunity to learn some of these techniques that we normally allow a child to learn just through osmosis, just through modeling, just through being at the park or the birthday party or at school. And a lot of children haven't been able to get that repetition in practice. And these emotional intelligence and social emotional skills that we just kind of assume are going to happen didn't happen. And so, so many children have spent their, their summers and in their school years in a situation where they really have had a problem. And so many children have gone to emergency rooms and mental health facilities because of their inability to be able to get some of these practices. And COVID has really elevated that to the next level. And as teachers, we have seen children come in that haven't been able to get these skills, and it really is causing a problem in the school-wide setting. Now, emotional intelligence is, is really amazing. I would give you just a little quiz. How many times greater do you believe that emotional intelligence is in determining the effectiveness of their schooling versus their IQ. As a matter of fact, IQ is important, but they say, the studies show, that emotional intelligence is four times greater in regards to determining how well children are going to do in their field and as at school. This is an important fact because emotional intelligence is something that's going to take them over the edge and is going to give them that extra thing that they need that is really going to make a big difference. IQ is important. We want them to have rational thinking skills and be able to do the equations and be able to do these things. But eventually you're going to get a situation, the child is going to get into a situation where they're not just doing the equations themselves. Now they're managing people who are doing the equations or they are a manager or they're someone who deals with people and all of a sudden that those IQ skills, the curriculum and the knowledge that they've learned is important, but now they have to present it in a social setting. They have to put it in a group, work together collaboratively and all these different things that emotional intelligence is really going to make a huge difference with. Now, I have to tell you a story because I really thought it was funny because when kids just have a great way of being able to use their, their sense of humor and their ability to just make things better. And when they have emotional intelligence and IQ and all together, everything wraps up together. And I have to tell you a story about a little friend of mine in kindergarten. We were working on lifetime skills and we were working on tricycle ability, being able to to push the skills, excuse me, push the tricycle around. And this happened to be a special needs class. It was an ASD class, younger. And the they got really good at using these tricycles. And I almost, I had to slow them down because so many times the kids were just whipping around the multi-purpose room and I had to figure out a way to slow them down. They were just getting too good. Well, I decided to give them a password as they went by. And so that would slow them down enough to have them restart. So I told one kid, okay, what's the password? And he, he stopped for a minute, thought about it, chicken wing. And the next kid came around and he said, uh, I said, what's the password? And he goes, uh, Darth Vader. I said, okay, good. And one little girl I could see was slowing down and she was thinking. And as she went by, I noticed that she wasn't slowing down. She started speeding up. And as she went by, she said, sun pass and zoom went right by. Well, here in Florida, that is the name of the toll system, the automatic toll system that, where you don't have to stop. 
And so she just whizzed by and was able to use her intelligence and our ability just to to make things better, so much fun. And I really wanted to share that story because everybody really seems to enjoy it. And it's a way that kids are able to put emotional intelligence, their ability to be social, their ability to be funny, and their IQ together. Now, I've talked about emotional intelligence and how I really believe that it's an amazing part of the school age learning, and I really do. But it's not just about emotions. The great thing about emotional intelligence, it's broken up into different parts. We are talking about social skills. Social skills is a huge one when it comes to school, and we'll be talking about that. We also have emotional regulation or self-regulation, being able to control their emotions. Self-awareness is a huge one. If the kids don't know where they're going or what they want to do, it makes it very difficult and makes that road extra bumpy and swervy. We also have empathy. Empathy is a tough one to teach, but it really is something that is, is necessary in the classroom. And the last one is motivation. Motivation, what is going to motivate a child to do their very best and to get them to the very top? Now, while you're thinking about this, and now I've given you all the different parts of emotional intelligence, think about it really quick and ask yourself, which one of these skills do, do your or components do, does your school need the most or do your, does your classroom need the most? Because sometimes kids are really good at emotional regulation, but they have a hard time with social skills and vice versa. So think about it for a minute and think about which of these social, excuse me, these parts of emotional intelligence is going to be the best fit for you and your classroom. Now, the thing about emotional intelligence. And this is something that I've seen in my 25 years of teaching. And I'm not a PhD. I don't publish papers. But what I have seen is lots and lots of kids. And the one thing that I've seen is that I would say, I would equate for every one academic situation that they, a child is in, there's probably anywhere between 10 and 15 non-academic situations that they are put in. And so if there are quite a bit, and this is just m my own kind of small little study that I've done, I'm sure if we would dug through the paperwork, we might find something in there. But the thing is, is that why not teach a child about these alternative strategies or these alternative things other than education since there's so many more of them. If there's for every one academic situation, there is five, 10 or 15 non-academic situations. It just makes sense. And many of those non-academic situations are based on emotional intelligence, the social skills, making friends, how to deal with conflict, how to know what you want and how to ask for what you want. All of these things are part of schooling, but are not necessarily part of the curriculum. And when we're able to do that, when we're able to teach our kids how to deal with the situations outside the curriculum that are really making up most of their day, it just makes sense that it's going to make their life easier. So we have social skills. There's so many things about social skills that I want to talk about, but the main thing is making friends. We just assume that kids are going to just make friends, and some of them do, but many kids have so many difficulties doing that. It makes sense for us to prompt students and to help them and give them opportunities so that they can learn the strategies and build the confidence to make friends. We have spend all this time and extrinsic reward systems and tangible reward systems on getting students to come to school. But in reality, if we're working on social skills, we can do that intrinsically by giving them the opportunity to make friends. The more friends they have, the more likely they're going to come to school. If a child likes where they learn, the chances are they're going to be there. And social skills is a huge part of that. We also have motivation. We talked about motivation as part of our social skills. Motivation is a big deal. Getting our students where they need to be. It's, it's very difficult for us to just assume that they're going to want to do it because that's what's best for them. I'm a firm believer. It's starting extrinsically and moving 
too intrinsically through tangible rewards, positive praise, and the rest. Just great behavior management and, of course, positive behavior rewards. And so the way that works is that we start off with something that's very important that many times students are not taught, which is persistence and discipline. We have to understand and have, to have them understand that, that the road is not always going to be smooth. It's going to be bumpy and it could be difficult and there's going to be trials and tribulations. And when we teach our children persistence, never giving up, continuing and understanding that it's not about failing, it's not about losing, it's about learning. And each time we lose or we fail, there's something that we can be taught. And that in turn is going to bring us up to the next level, give it, giving us a chance to win. Discipline is another very important part. We have to teach our students study skills. We have to give them opportunity to practice hard things, even though they don't want to do it. And when we give them opportunities to practice this and give them the repetition, it is going to make their lives so much easier and they're going to be so much more motivated. Now, self-awareness is another big part of emotional intelligence. As I mentioned before, when a child knows which direction they're going in, it really makes all these things that they have to go through so much more simple and easy. It's never going to be perfectly easy, but when you have the understanding that this is the direction and this is what you want, you're able to face those difficulties with much more poise and being able to get to that direction a lot quicker. And I want to tell you a quick story because the one of the, the most persistent people that that really that I can think of at this moment is Arnold Schwarzenegger. And the reason why this, this story is brought up because somebody was talking about him, about how he finished his fourth or fifth set of squats of 500 pounds or more. And, and he just was sweating down. And he just had just pouring down in sweat. You could tell he was exhausted and he was smiling and he was getting ready to do his next step. His next set, I should say. And they were like, what's wrong with you? Like, why are you so happy to do one more of this just incredibly difficult and painful repetition of weightlifting? And he realized, he said, listen, I knew since I was a child that I wanted to be Mr. Universe. And even though this is one of the most difficult exercises that you can do, and if anybody's ever done a squat, you can tell it's a full body workout and it's extremely difficult. But... Every time and every set that I do gets me one step closer to my goal, even, even if it is extremely difficult and extremely painful. And that's the things that self-awareness allows our children, is that it's going to be difficult. It might be painful. There's going to be trials and tribulations. But if we have the awareness and the direction of what we want and what we want to do, it makes those trials and tribulations and pain a lot easier to deal with. Now, self-regulation is another big part of emotional intelligence. It is something that so many times people have just a difficult time doing. They don't give themselves the ability to calm down and make rational decisions. The barking dog part of their brain will not let them calm down. It's very similar to when we all know that you, if you're wanting to teach a child or discipline a child, you can't yell at them because their barking dog part of their brain, the limbic system in their brain is the fight or flight part is, is just ringing as loudly as possible and any type of learning is shut down. You need to be able to get a child and even an adult out of that fight or flight, get the limbic system shut down, and so the prefrontal cortex jumps in. That's the wise owl. And so many times when that wise owl or that cognitive part of the brain is now clicked in and dialed in, now we're able to make rational decisions and make the smart decisions that we need to do. And when we are not given the ability to do that, it, it really does dampen 
their ability to make proper and rational decisions. And one of the great ways to do that is through cognitive reappraisal. You're able to change the narrative by ch as assuming that things are positive. My philosophy is if you have to assume something, it might as well be positive. And so if there is a situation that you're unsure of that might make you uncomfortable or mad, but you don't know what's really going on, what is the possibility that they're really being mean to you or disrespecting you, you can change the narrative, change and reappraise the situation into something that is more, more positive. If you're driving down the road, somebody's in your way, they're, they're going five, five, ten miles under the speed limit, rather than honking and getting upset, you can change your thinking and say, well, what, is, what if that was my grandparent? What, was that, what if that was my young child just learning to drive? And all of a sudden, you're now able to call that wise owl in. The prefrontal cortex is now working, and you have changed the narrative, and it's much easier to make a better decision and do the right thing. Now, one of the most important parts of making sure that the child has self-regulation and emotional regulation is teaching the children to breathe right away. So many times we forget how important it is to teach our children to calm down. And the great study that was done by Dr. John Diel, he is a neuroscientist and, and brain surgeon, I believe. And he talked about a story about how his patients or a group of patients had seizures and they were trying to figure out how to help with the epilepsy. And the best way to do that is to pinpoint in the brain where the seizure is occurring. Well, the problem is, is they weren't able to do that in some people. So they actually had to take up the skull and put a little grid, almost like a battleship game, and figure out when the epilepsy occurred or the seizures occurred, there would be a little blip and they would know what part of the brain. Well, unfortunately, couldn't make people have a seizure, so they just had to wait. And they didn't want to waste the time. And so what they did is they started using some of these techniques where we, they hadn't been studied, but we feel like they really are important and very helpful. And one of those was regulated breathing or cyclic breathing. What they found out was that rhythmic breathing on these brain scans of these patients had the same internal brain monitors and waves and signals as a, a person that was on Valium or anti-anxiety medication. So we can trigger these brain chemicals and the ability to calm down without medication, but through proper rhythmic breathing. And it seems so simple, but so many times we don't use this to our best benefit. And one of the best ways to do that is do what's, what a strategy called infinity breathing. I like to do it on my hand because it'll, it allows that tactile feeling. And what it is, is you have the ability to use the tactile feeling as well as the breath. And you do it in an eight. So you take a deep breath up. And then around and you breathe out. Breathe up and out. And you do an eight or an infinity sign back and forth and it calms the child down. And it, in the beginning, it, you need the tactile, you need the hand, and then eventually it'll just come to breath. And then eventually your, the child will automatically, as soon as they start feeling through the, enough practice and repetition, they will understand that the first thing they need to do is start breathing and calm themselves down, calm the barking dog, and bring in the wise owl. And now the decision-making part of the brain is there. And the last one is empathy. Empathy is seeing things from another person's perspective or viewpoint. And one of the best ways that you can build a environment in the classroom is set up a risk-free environment. And I don't necessarily mean where people, there's no risk taking. It's that you can take risks free 
of, judge, of judgment. And when you're able to set up that type of environment where kids can make mistakes and they're actually celebrate for them because they put in the effort, they are losing in a sense, but they really don't understand that it's just losing. They really understand that it's learning. And these type, this type of environment in the classroom is going to make a phenomenal difference for the children to be able to push themselves to the boundaries. And empathy is the way you do that. You give the children a time and really discuss how people are feeling, how a child can see things from another person's viewpoint, what it would feel like if somebody was laughing at them or a other, other situations set up that opportunity for children to practice empathy and you will start to see children make much better gains and they're starting to make risks. They're starting to take risks, which is going to set them to the next level. Now, you've heard a lot of different strategies and different techniques. What I want you to do is which one of these strategies do you really think is going to be best for you? Now that we have specifics, is it making friends? Is it going to be teaching empathy? Is it going to be focusing on self-awareness? So think about that and think about how you can bring these strategies back to your classroom. Now, as you know, as educators, we wear so many hats. We are pretty much everything and we don't want to add one more hat on to your balancing act. We're spinning plates, we're juggling balls, whatever analogy you want to use. But the best way to incorporate this together is to start emotional intelligence in the beginning, just as you would behavior management. Incorporate the two. It, merge behavior management and social, or excuse me, emotional intelligence together. And you, in the very beginning of the year, and you are going to have an amazing class. Start using these strategies right along the rules and regulations and the expectations that you set with behavior management. Put these together and it's going to make your classroom so much easier. My friends, I want to finish with a quick story. My daughter was putting together, they were in science, they were doing marshmallow shooters. And her and her partner were, were being measured on how far their marshmallow shot and it was part of science experiment. And a child looked over at my daughter's and her partner's and said, uh, marshmallow shooter or catapult, and said, oh, you guys are not going to do good at all. I can tell right away. And my daughter looked over, and she was telling me this story. She looked over at her partner and said, you know what? I, th I think the reason why he's saying that is because he probably didn't spend as much time as we did on our project. And we know our project's going to do well. And then, Daddy, I just moved on. We just moved on. And that's the key, my, my friends, is we want our children to be able to move on. Emotional intelligence allows our students and our children to move on. It allows them to take care of these non-academic situations that occur and allow the children to come to class and to allow them to be able to be in the right mindset for learning. And if when their social situation is taken care of, when their emotions are taken care of, then they can come to class and be ready to learn and they can move on from whatever they need to do. I really appreciate you being here with me. I hope that this has helped you. I would love to be part of your community. Please take a look at the screen. I have a QR code on there. You're more than welcome to use your phone. That'll bring you right to all that my social media platforms. One of the great things about being a school teacher is that we need a community to be able to work with. And I would love to be part of your community. And I would love for you to be part of my community as well. I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. And please enjoy the World Education Summit for the rest of the time. Thank you.